Yo, yo, welcome to another episode of Weird Growth, the podcast where we hear about the strange and often unpredictable journeys that startup founders take. Um, this episode, uh, we have Marina Wu, the co-founder and chief community officer of Early Work. Um, many of you would have heard of Early Work, a really cool upcoming community in the startup space. Uh, which is a hub for thousands of young people who are looking to build meaningful careers in the tech and startup space. Um, welcome, Marina. Thanks so much for joining us on Weird Growth today. Oh, thanks for having me, Cam. Looking forward to this chat. Yeah, and no, I really appreciate you uh, giving up the time to, to jump on. Um, could you please introduce yourself and just l- give us a little bit of background about what Early Work's really all about? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm Marina, um, one of the three co-founders or three musketeers in yeah. the early work crew. Um, I look after community specifically. Um, so yeah, we have a Slack community right now. It's like two and a half thousand young people all across Australia and New Zealand who are just really interested in the area of like startups, tech, social impact. Uh, we call those like the careers of tomorrow. Um, we also have like a newsletter arm, which is run by Dan, our chief meme and chief shill officer um he comes up with amazing career resources every single week and yeah get that into inboxes for free and the third part of early work is of course like the hiring side of things so run by our chief handshake officer Jono. Uh, so really what we're trying to do is just connect um young people early in their careers to like the right opportunities in the very exciting world of startups and tech so all these three things together make up this wonderful little used to be side hustle, now full-time hustle called um, Early Work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, it's, a, it's a fantastic um, community that you've built and, you know, a lot of the ammo team are in, involved in Early Work um, and, you know, I'm probably a little bit, I'm 35, basically ancient in this space. Um, you know, you guys are very much a Gen Z kind of brand, um, but I think it's awesome what, you, what, you, what you've created there and it's empowering a lot of young people early on in their careers and, um, yeah, it's really exciting. So good on you for what you're doing before we get stuck into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts about how you grew early work uh, um we've got a little pop quiz that we ask at the start of weird growth don't worry it's not too scary okay it's basically if you were to start a new business from scratch today what would it be what sort of space would you be working in oh great question um so for context i spent like three years volunteering for an education not-for-profit called um generation entrepreneur so, and I did that when I was, you know, a couple early years in university. So high school education has like a very close place in my heart. Mm. Um, and just, you know, going through high school myself, you realize that a lot of the things you learn are very like, not so practical in real life and you're living right. in a bit of a bubble. So yeah, I think if I had to do something again, it would definitely be in like that education space. Yeah. Uh, certainly a massive challenge, I think, is that we've got this disconnect between traditional education and university and the real world uh, workspace and people are just coming out of even uni and not being necessarily ready to hit the ground running, right? Yeah, exactly. And like, I think in high school, you know, when you do the HSC or whatever the U12 exams are, um, you're making a really big decision in your life. It's kind of like you do your exam, you get a number and with that number, you have a select like range of choices to make with your degree. And from that degree, you're expected to choose like the right career. And that's like one third of your life. And I just think that is like such a big decision. And it's like quite daunting for someone who's like 16, 17, 18 to make. And I think um, the world has evolved a lot beyond that now. And yeah, um, yeah, the education system needs to evolve with it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the education system, it was designed in the like industrial revolution era where we were training up people to work in factories and uh you know exactly or in offices um yeah i think it's something that's really important especially for that formative you know 15 to 20 age bracket where people are starting to figure out where they fit in the world they, they discover yeah. their passions but they're not necessarily given the opportunities to follow those through and turn them into real skills um yeah yeah, yeah for sure like i graduated high school thinking that the like the life ahead of me and the glamorous life ahead of me was going to be working in like a big building with thousands of people like me and my heels a handbag and like coffee in one hand and I thought that was like the life (laughs) but um yeah I think I was very lucky to have fallen into startup land which is completely different yeah one promising thing I'm seeing in this space over here in um, WA at least is this sort of studio school 
concept and um, there's these, this great program called IDEA over here where uh, students in the, the last years of high school get to work on projects and startups and it kind of goes towards their finishing you know, SAT or whatever it's called now. Um, so I think that's a really cool concept. I'd love to see more of that and you know, hopefully it leads to yeah, better outcomes. For, for sure. I, I think there are like little pockets or like individuals, smaller organisations just really trying to like get in there. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think it will it won't really take off unless it happens from like a federal like a state level so i think we're starting to see signs of like you know education changing um to sort of match what the real world is like but you know always more to be done always and what is the real problem that you're trying to solve with early work you know there's that education space but what, you know, what's what are you really trying to achieve with early work yeah early work i mean I think that um, as you spend more and more time in early work, like things just become so much clearer as opposed to what the problem is we're solving. Like at the very start, the main reason why I wanted to do early work was because like getting into product management or another like growth marketing or any of the techie or startup careers is really, really hard for a young person. Like most people are hiring for seniors. Um, these jobs aren't like listed publicly. You have to like snake your way into LinkedIn DMs. Like if you don't know how to play the game, you, you just can't get the job. Yeah. So you need like three to five me, like, the, years experience in growth marketing when, you know, what, like, how do you even get into the ground floor or something like that? Exactly. And what people don't know is that if you LinkedIn DM the right person, they might not even need that sort of experience. So mm. for me at the very start, it was very much like a, like a gap in the career like knowledge sort of space. But I think um, as I spent more time in the community as well, what I've noticed is that people who are early in their career and working with startups and tech, it's really fucking lonely as well because you're often the only junior person and you're just really wanting to like meet peers, which you know, in a small company just doesn't really happen sometimes. Yep. Whereas if you worked at like a big bank or something, you have a hundred other, other grads who are like your best friends. Um, so yeah, like as we started the, the community, that was like a really big driving reason why, you know, that was, uh, that was a problem we wanted to solve as well. So yeah, I think as we get deeper and deeper into the space, we obviously discover more of these things, but those are some of the key problems we wanted to tackle. Yeah. Fantastic. How did you reach your first early community members oh uh, so yeah that was really interesting and it's like a year ago actually i think actually today is probably one year um since we started the community no which is way. really exciting well, happy birthday and what a you know amazing journey in only a year i know it's just flown by like mm. i had to look at my calendar just then to be like oh my god it's been a year <laughs> so Honestly, at the very start, um, it was just our friends, like friends we had, you know, come across who we've um, just known from like different uni circles. And we, they also sort of shared similar experiences to us um, in the sense that they were, you know, uh, the only junior employee and didn't know what the heck was going on yep. or they were just trying to break into startups. So we, the first community members were really our friends and like our circles. But I think as time goes on, you have to do a lot of pushing at the start, but I think we've gotten to a nice point where people start referring their friends and their friends start bringing their friends in. So yeah, it, it's grown to a pretty nice spot. Was there anything, anything specific you did to take it from that early friends sort of group to, to grow and, you know, expand the, the influence in the community? Yeah, I think this is such an interesting with, uh, thing when it comes to like, community building. So at the very start, um, like the three of us are doing a lot of the pushy. So, and that's kind of what you need to do at the start. Uh -huh. um, 90% of the conversation is started by like the three of us. And when people send us DMs asking maybe like, oh, I'll, you know, tell me a bit more about product management, for example, I'd have to DM them back and be like, hey, can you post this in a public channel so everyone can see that there's stuff actually happening in the mm. Slack channel? So, so just had to, to be like, clear kind of at the start. People. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just to be clear, like at the start, it was literally just a Slack channel, right? That you were just inviting people into. Yeah, we literally had one channel called like the general channel. Yeah, and then we were just like, "Hey, everybody, how's it going? Introduce yourselves, say hello," and people were just um like, and I think when people start introducing themselves, it's kind of like, "Holy shit, there are like other people like me, or there are people mm. who are working in a space I'm really interested in." Yeah. So those early connections start to form, which is really exciting. But still, of course we had to do a lot of the pushing 
But I think it gets to a point where um, people start understanding what like the vibe is of the community, what the culture is like, the fact that there are amazing people who are really um, like approachable as well, like send them a DM and you've just reached them right away. And I think as like that culture builds and as the community gets more men- momentum, um, people like catch wind of it. And of course, with our, like, a lot of our content and marketing, we tell everyone about it as well. So um, you get you have this flywheel going essentially and you keep turning it, turning it. And then one day, it was a really special day actually. I think Dan, John and I just didn't touch the community at all. And there were still people talking and we were like, holy shit, wow. this is cool. It's got a life of its own. This community yeah. m- like marketing or community as a growth channel, I think it's, it seems like it's a, it's a trend, um, particularly around say crypto projects and things as well. Um, you know, yeah. Gen Z stuff. Why do you think that is is taking off the, the way it is? Oh, wow, that's a great question. I think um, the way – so I come from like a product background. So I, I've done a lot of reading from like, you know, early 2000s, 2010, everyone talks about like product market fit. Yep. And product market fit is like, you know, as horror words and, and all those big VCs say, like it's like a special feeling where you can't keep up with orders and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think right now we're shifting towards a period of like community market fit. Wow. So if you build an amazing audience, um, you build like the right type of people who are passionate about the same type of things. The minute you introduce a product to it, people will, like you have the audience ready for it. Right. And I think there's something really special about like building with the audience as well. Like for example, with that hiring products, like the, just the jobs board or even the talent network, like everything is for the community. And then the community knows that, you know, we're trying to serve them. And it's really nice to have people like on that product building journey with you. And back to your question, I think um, a lot of, with like the gig economy, the creator economy, a lot of individual people are being able to like run their own businesses, essentially. Like a person is now, a business. Right. So I think like that's such an interesting shift in how like companies and how businesses work. Um, so yeah, I think community is so important these days because honestly, it's one of the only moats left in business building. Mm. Um, a lot of technology can be copied. A lot of like brand and marketing tactics can be copied, but the one thing you can't really, you know, pick up the ground and put down somewhere else is the thousands of fans you've, a mask for your product. So yeah, super yeah, interesting. That, that, that's what I think. Yeah, no, uh, you, yeah, that's really interesting, Marina. Um, it you know, and and you know, everyone's getting more and more used to socializing in virtual spaces. It's more than just gaming and chat rooms now. It's um, you know that you do get people are used to having deeper connections. You know, through video chat or for through Slack or whatever that is. Um, if it's in work or in, in their in their sort of friendship groups, and I think because of the disconnect from the real world that we're having with COVID and things, there's still this real yearning for community connection beyond just your work colleagues, um, and yeah. that's becoming more and more important, especially for young people who don't have who who haven't grown up or well, you know in the last two years have missed out on that. Yeah, no, for sure. Like we started the community during like peak COVID. So this was Mm. April last year. So every, well, at least most of New South Wales and Victoria and just most of Australia was in lockdown. (laughs) And then um, we're all stuck in our houses and a lot of people really, you know, struggled, like myself included, just transitioning to remote work, not meeting people. And just, it's so much harder to like access the right people to ask questions as well. And I think, um, it was a blessing in disguise, I guess, for the community. Like COVID was like lockdown was terrible, but I think we started something at the right time where yeah. people were just really wanting to like connect with others. Yeah. And um, that's a brilliant thing about something that's online, right? Like if I'm talking to someone in Perth, I literally don't feel the difference because, you know, we're just talking like this. Um, yeah. And it just feels um, very normal now. And um, And you're right. I think it has evolved beyond... Uh, just like chat rooms, gaming. Um, I went to an in real life meetup yesterday, which was a group on Discord. And it's weird because you still know everyone by their Discord names and you <laughs> had to be like, so um, who, what's your real name? If you want to tell me, or should I just go by your Discord name? So it's like, 
the social rules have changed Amazing. as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? Like, it used to be a little bit like that in gaming. Maybe you know, ten or fifteen years ago, gaming was the first thing. You know, when I was in high school, almost you'd call people by their Counter Strike handle. You know, but they're all <laughs> awkward propeller head nerd kids rather than you know young professionals who are really personable people. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's super interesting. It started out as a, so earlier it started out as Slack channel and a, and a newsletter, like an email newsletter. Yeah. And then how did it sort of scale from there? You started offering job opportunities. What was the sort of next steps to scaling? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we've been focusing a lot on like the content arm. Um, like the newsletter was the content. first thing that Dan started. Right. Um, even before early work, as we know it today, is kind of like, yeah, what it is today. Okay. Um, so yeah, the content uh, piece started, the community came about after that because um, content is like a very one-way thing, right? Like we're shouting into the void and hoping someone gets some value out of it. And when you say content, then, you mean long-form um, article kind of stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like a long-form newsletter, for example, that's about how to land a startup job using LinkedIn DMs. Yep. Um, it's probably good, like career resource, like a really good career resource, but it's like, you know, you have to read through it and, you know, that's all you get out of it. And then, so that sort of evolved into the community where you can actually like have conversations with really cool people. So take it to the next step. And this is where like really interesting things happen. So um, when you get a bunch of really cool people into the room, like magic usually happens. So there were founders who were trying to hire for talents. There were young people who were just like interested, like grads maybe who were just um, exploring what like startup and tech was like. And what we found was that people just started, you know, talking to each other and all of a sudden they like landed a job wow. and we were just like, wow, like what the heck, this is actually so cool. Um, and we didn't even know to be honest until some people emailed us say you know thank you so much like i met so and so i'm now working at this place and we're like damn how can we make this opportunity sort of like open to the rest of the community and mm. people can know um who's hiring people can know what opportunities are out there so that's why we decided as one of the you know first experiments i guess you could say to launch like the jobs board and then now doing the talent network as well, where early workers in the community can be like, I am interested in this industry. I want to work in a small, medium, large company. Um, like this is what I'm about. And then employers can like uh, come talk to me if they think I might be a good fit. So yeah, that's how um, yeah the hiring side of things evolved. It all came out of the community. Yeah. Fantastic. And just all those serendipitous connections. And again, an amazing piece of timing to, you know, it's a job seekers market at the moment. Um, hard to find talent um, for, for companies, particularly in the tech space. So um, that's, that's really cool. Do you find there's a particular type, is it, is it mainly startup founders or corporates or any particular type of opportunities that you're seeing more of? Yeah, so um, early work as a whole, we've, decided to really focus on the careers of tomorrow. So startups, tech, social impact, like they're the companies that we really think will change the world for the better. Um, I think with bigger corporates or the more established brands, there are already spaces where they advertise really well, like uni job boards are like a great example. All the big companies are very plugged into uni. We wanted to bring a lot of, um, like bring some light to what's happening in the startup tech social impact space, which is like so exciting. I'm biased, but like it is where the magic magic is happening. Oh yeah. Um. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Like so, we've decided to really focus on that area, and I think naturally in the community, like we've just attracted a lot of young founders, um, like hiring managers in like some tech companies, and that's sort of just how these um, connections have been formed. Nice one. Well. What advice would you have for startup founders who are ready to, to hire, you know, their earliest sort of employees um, or Ooh. team members and, and using early work to do that? Yeah, interesting. So I think like, the, you're right, like it is the job seekers market right now. And I think with the great resignation or great reshuffle or whatever we want to call yeah. it, um, there is so much going on in the hiring space. Like everyone seems to be hiring for like software engineers. I, I really think that like companies who want to hire the best talent just 
really need to have a great understanding of who they are as a company, like really showcase what your mission is about, what you're trying to achieve with your product. And I think, especially with early career talent, I, I at least, like I'm much more drawn to a company that has great values and the product is actually doing something meaningful as opposed to like being a small cog in like a big, big company. So I think like companies should really be open to taking on earlier career talent, giving them probably more responsibility than they deserve. And I think what you'll often see is that most of these people will really flourish and they'll become some great contributors to the company. Yeah. The amazing thing at the moment or, you know, in the, in the time that we live in is you, you can pick up skills super quick. You know, Google is a keystroke away. If you have the mindset and the drive to learn and teach yourself, um, you know, the, the tasks that bosses are asking their teams to do nowadays, um, they, they don't know how to do themselves. Like they're not able to sit down there at a keyboard and teach you because they don't know like how to run an ad campaign on TikTok. You need to figure that stuff out for yourself. And the pace of change with most of these um, roles now is so quick that you know you need to be sort of dedicated to lifelong learning. Uh, and that's the sort of attitude I think someone is passionate about advancing themselves all the time that's the sort of the, the real core kind of um, not even a skill set but like that personality type that you want to bring on to your business they're the ones who are going to help you grow your business um, as opposed to someone who might be have worked for an agency for five years because they're just going to bring all that baggage and the way that things have always yeah. been done and well you know i only do this xyz um, i think that's a really op- the really cool opportunity for hiring young people oh absolutely like honestly our resumes probably don't look brilliant like you we've done a bunch of internships in a bunch of random different places Who reads but resumes i think <laughs> yeah but i think like um you're right like what we like what early uh people in early careers bring is like grit uh hunger to actually like better themselves passion for the problem space as well so i think like a lot of people are very coachable and you're right like everything is on the internet these days if i can't do something i google it and most likely I can figure it out from the top search result on Google. Yeah. So yeah, I think like there's so like no one's asked me what my ATAR is. No one looks at my resume anymore. It's kind of just like, what can you bring to the table? Yep. Um, what kind of experiences might you have that might you know assist you? But no one really cares about those type of things, at least in like most startup tech social impact yeah. companies. Are you a good fit for seen. our team? Are you aligned with what we're trying to achieve? And are you driven to do what it takes to help us achieve it? That's, that's what you want to hear. Yeah, I really exactly. Liked what, I really liked what you said earlier about community being one of the last moats um, or what, you know, one of the remaining moats left. Um, what would you say to, say, a startup founder who wants to use community as a growth channel? How do you, like, where would they start? Oh, really good question. Wow. Like, to be honest, like, I think we landed on something quite special by a bit of a fluke, but, you know, in 2020, uh, with 2020 hindsight, um, there were things that worked really well for us, but I think it is still a journey that I am on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think something that people really appreciate these days is authenticity. Um, so people or brands that start communities for the sake of building a community, people can see right through that bullshit. So it's kind of like, if you're just trying to amass a bunch of people in a Facebook page just to sell them your product and not actually like care, um, it is so, so obvious. Um, And I think people get even more annoyed about that than if there wasn't a community at all. So I think like um, how businesses should really approach it is number one from like a place of authenticity, a place of genuinely wanting to connect with the people they're trying to reach a place where they generally genuinely want to like, you know, talk to these people, learn about their lives and like why they've come to this brand in the first place. And like, when you think about it, this is like user research. This is like what every company should be doing anyway. But I think um, as you start bringing in more people, start learning more about their stories, they feel more attached to you. So I think just be authentic, be like a real human and not a brand. And I would also say, like, don't be afraid to show a little bit of, like, personality as well. Like, 
we, uh, as at early work, we, you know, we, we love memes and we love like gifts and stuff. And I think that tone of voice, the sort of playfulness really comes through in our content and like what we post as well. Yep. Sometimes it's a bit scrappy, but it's just funny. So well, and I it think helps people actually quite like officer. that. Exactly. Like Dan is so good at that stuff. Like honestly. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. And I think people just like, knowing that the brands that they're working with are real and there are real people behind it. It doesn't need to be like pixel perfect polished. It it feels more real when there's some like scruffiness to it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, people connect with, with other humans, right? They don't connect with a brand. They're not, you know, robots. So yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, Such good advice, Marina. Thank you. Early work recently received pre-seed funding from investors, including uh, SquarePeg. Um, really exciting! Yeah. Congratulations. Thank how, you. How have you found that investment process, and why did it make sense for you guys to do that? Wow, really good question. Um, like to be completely honest, at the start, uh, well, early last year as well, we weren't actively thinking about taking VC investment. I think the mindset was still very much like we wanted to progress in our own careers a bit and keep this as like a really meaningful side hustle, like. Yeah. I said very like openly to Dan and Jono, like I want to get to like senior product manager before I consider doing my own thing. And they were all on the same page and we had our own goals as well. And you're a finder, right? Just to be, just so everyone's got the back end. You're a product manager or, you know, running product at finder. Awesome. Yeah. So amazing career. Yeah. It was so much fun as well. Like Mm. building the app, shipping new features as well. So I was like, really liking my job as well. So, yeah, um, but honestly, it when something like the community takes off the way it does, it is really hard to ignore. Um, and yeah, the way we got in touch with SquarePeg was actually through our earliest group of advisors. We called them our, um, our sages. So <laughs> essentially these are just some people that we knew personally just to make sure, um, have, you know, have some, have, have a person to bounce ideas off people to tell us if we're doing something like completely off track or like if we're on point. Yep. So one of the advisors was um, Lucy Tan who uh, works at Square Peg. And yeah, I think word traveled up and then we started thinking more seriously about the future of early work. And I think the main reason why we wanted to take on investment was so we could actually give it our all, actually have a really, really good shot at this um, and give the business the, love the effort the energy that it actually deserves and yeah see what we can do with a little bit of um a little bit of a push so exciting and like frankly on the surface it it didn't seem like something that needed investment or that people would you know invest it doesn't seem like a traditional you know vc tech kind of investment play right yeah, yeah, for sure. And that was one of the reasons why we weren't um, like actively looking, like because we we're like, no, early work is not some sexy SaaS B two B product. Like that's yeah. not something that VCs want to. Um, we're not something that VCs want to invest in. Yeah, like um, what's and, your MRR, and you know, how do you how are you going to achieve ten x return from them and all that sort of thing? Yeah, I was just like, uh, we have a newsletter and we have a Slack group. Like that was <laughs> pretty much it at the time, to be honest. Um, but I think that's why we had to be like really, really intentional about how we had to do this. And we had to be really picky about who we partner up with as well, because it is very, very easy. I think to like fall into the trap of being like, fuck, we just got to like pump the numbers and just like forget the mission almost. It's just about like returns and the growth. And yep. that's why um, if, if you read like the square peg investment memo, we, we were like a balance sheet investment. And I think just, that method of investing just gave us a little bit of confidence that we are in this for the long term with our investors and they're very much in this with us. And this is something that we're doing for the startup ecosystem and not just for the sake of like a hundred X returns in seven years. So good to hear. Uh, that's, that's really great. Well done. Um, and, and it's so cool to see that, you know, you're coming at it from the point of view. Now you can give it your all and, and really find out what, what, you're capable of, of creating with this community and what the, what the brand is capable of doing uh, to help people. It's so cool. Well done. Thanks. And what, what could possibly be next for the future? Wow. Uh, like, this is a really great question. Like, we, we've been chatting very actively about it now, now that we have, you know, the support and, like, the funding as well. 
And I think like there are so many different ways we can tackle the big hairy problem of early careers. And um, we've definitely made a lot of headway in like content community hiring as well. So I think first and foremost, we are a community based company. So the way we think about it is like, this is the community. We'll have a great, we'll build up a great acquisition funnel into the community and we'll build products and services like around the community. So everything like revolves around the community essentially. So Perfect. obviously in the you know next couple of months and into the you know foreseeable future, we will be actively building the community. And when I say that, what I I don't just mean like getting more people into the community, but making sure that the people in there have a really good time. Like one of our goals is to create the most like lovable community in like the career space. And that doesn't just mean pumping the numbers. Um, it yeah. means that everyone feels, you know, drawn to the mission. They like identify with being like an early worker. They feel involved in like the sub communities that we've built. For example, we just started like a Gen Z founders channel. Um, and then that's really just like for the founders of the community to talk about all those, you know, ups and downs of being a founder. Um, so that's just one example of the sub communities that we're building. Um, and then, yeah, we'll be building out more of our hiring products as well. Like we've just been in like a beta mode for our talent directory. So hopefully we can like really bring that to wow. more startups across ANZ and um, get help more people hire, help more people get jobs as well. And yeah, we'll see what the future lies, but this is sort of, how we're thinking about the next um, six months. Did I see something about like a big brother house or some, <gasps> some sort of home, oh home share or something? Is this legit? Is this just Oh, uh, How just could I meme? forget? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the, the, the thinking behind that is um, the best communities are in real life and like geographically, you know, everyone's in the same location. Online mm. communities are great, but it has to have like that, in real life connection. And um, so Dan Brockwell, one of our founders, he was like, I think he was inspired by like the launch houses starting up in like the US and how you could just get a bunch of cool people building cool shit in the same room and just see what happens out of it. So launch, yeah, launch house, what's that? What's a launch house? Launch, yeah, it's like a hacker house sort of thing. So yeah, just find a bunch of people who are all building their own projects get them in the same house and they like what Ehrlich like, Backman had in the, in Silicon Valley. Exactly. Eating so Dan Brockwell is our Ehrlich Backman. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's an Australian Ehrlich Backman. Wow. Yeah. So um, he's moving out to Wollongong, um, which is like a, an hour and a half away from Sydney, a little bit far, but not too far yeah. um, to oh, like live a with a bunch of cool builders and just see what happens. Epic. And, Okay, so there's a lot going on at Early Work. This is super exciting. So you're just giving things a crack. Yeah, a lot going on. Like, I'm just, just as I'm talking, listing out all these different things, I'm like, damn, there's a lot going on. Yeah, I'm exhausted. Um, <laughs> this has been so fun. I would love to hear from you what your one big piece of advice for founders would be. Ooh, um, Wow, that, there's so much I wish I could say to people. Yeah. <laughs> um, just because I've been like full time in this for like two months now. Um, I think like if I could slightly twist the question a little bit, I think there are a lot sure. of people who are early in their careers and always say like in five to 10 years time, I want to start my own business. I've met so many people like that. Uh, yeah. Or people who are like working in a startup or a tech company and they're like, I'm going to do my own thing in a few years. And like the thing that um, I've realized is the biggest risk is really to not do that crazy idea that you've been thinking about. Like that one idea you can't shake from your mind. The biggest risk is not going out and working on it. So honestly, what's the worst that can happen? You just go back to your own job. So like, and that's not terrible, but I think there, there are only so many times in your life when you can really have a big crack at one thing that you're really passionate about. So I would encourage anyone who's on the fence or like thinking about it or have plans five to 10 years in the future, just to like do it now. Like if the time is right and you have like the passion for it, why not now? Just do it. That is amazing advice. And if, I, if 
if anyone out there listening takes anything away from this chat, that is absolutely it, is that you are not going to learn more being out in corpo land in five or ten years that is going to make you more ready to start a business. Yeah. You know, it Definitely. might make you feel more confident or something, but you, the things that you learn out in that space is, are not going to be necessarily applicable to what you – you're not going to learn any faster. Start now. That's really, really great advice. Yeah, well said. Um, one last thing before we wrap up is we love asking our guests what their favourite tool or device or bit of software is that changes their life every day that, that you love using. Um, what's something that, that makes your life better that you use all the time? Yeah, I have to think about this one a lot. Um, and I think there are so many things that we use every single day and you kind of just like take them for granted. So I really had to like look around my room and be like, what is something I use every day that genuinely makes like, you know, a difference in my life. And yeah. honestly, this was a gift from one of my friends. He got me a LifeX smart light bulb, like one of those Wi-Fi light yeah. bulbs. Yeah. So it, it goes into just think, your, your lamp or something. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And I think LifeX was like a Blackbird portfolio company or something. So, you know, the startup vibe, nice. that's so me. Yep. It was like mm-hmm. 50 bucks, I think. And then I got a $20 globe from Ikea. So, the, the reason why this changes my life every day is because at the same time, every single night I can tell the light to like turn on and then yep. it tells me, okay, Marina, it's time to wind down. And then nice. I can force the light to turn off at like, you know, 11, 11, 30 and it'll be like, Marina, it's time to sleep. So it really, <laughs> it's so easy to just like look at your screen all day that when yep. I have something to like remind me to start or stop something, it really helps. So, good. so yes. Yeah. It's like and you can do fun. To tell you to get a bed. Yeah, exactly. And you can do so many fun things as well. Like there's like a setting where you can turn on like a gradient and there are like rainbow lights as well. So, you know, add a little bit of fun <laughs> to your I life. It. Yeah, I love my little, my smart, I use all the Google sort of suite of stuff at home and, you know, you tell Google to turn the lights on or, you know, play music or whatever. And it's just, yeah, you do, it becomes so seamless and part of your life that you forget how convenient it is. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Not the flashiest thing, but something that actually gets me to bed on time every day. So it's called LifeX? Yes, L-I-F-X. Okay. We'll chuck it in the, in the show notes. Well, thank you so much for being part of Weird Growth. This has been one of the most intriguing, enlightening chats I think that we've had in a long time. Um, so I really appreciate you, you sharing your wisdom. Um, what's the final plug or final ask for people who might be interested in getting involved? With you earlier? Oh, my favourite part, I've learned well from Dan. So yep. if you want weekly career resources about like startups, tech, social impact, um, check it out on our website, earlywork.co. You can find our newsletter. You can get access to our community there as well. And if you're looking for a job, um, you'll find links to our job sport and our talent directory as well. So yeah, check it out. Yeah, fantastic. I think the feedback that I get from the you know, AMO team members who are part of early work is just, as you said, that connection with other people who are at that stage of their career. Um, it do, you don't feel like you're alone. But also mm-hmm. there's a lot of sharing that goes on and you know, you're just levelling up your knowledge and finding out new resources and cool new links and things that you'd never otherwise would have stumbled across. So I think what you've created there is just super valuable. Oh, um, well thanks, Ken. And well done to the team. Um, but thank you for being part of Weird Growth again um, and thank you everybody out there for listening to another episode of Weird Growth. Um, if you've enjoyed uh, the episode, please do subscribe. Spotify has a new feature now on the mobile app where you can rate us, um, a star rating. Um, so make sure you do that if you can or if you're on YouTube or something like that, leave a review. We really do depend on, on you guys giving us your feedback and, um, and being involved in the community to grow weird growth. So um, that's it for us. Thanks again, Marina. Thanks for having so, me. I had a lot of fun. See you next time. And that's it for now on Weird Growth. Bye-bye.